All right, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, our next speaker, uh, Jim Langford. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Jim Langford yesterday, and Bill Bowling said, you know, Jim's a serial do-gooder, which is true, but doesn't really explain, you know, um, all of Jim's talents. I would describe him as a polymath as well. Uh, a graduate of the Grady School of Journalism here at UGA, he then received his MBA from Harvard uh, Business School. And in addition to starting several technology companies, he always found his way back to public service to give back um, to the community. So over the last 35 years, he served on, uh, he was appointed by five governors uh, to several statewide commissions and boards. Currently, he is the executive director for the Georgia Meth Project, which is part of the Georgia Prevention Project. Uh, but also, has anyone been on the Beltline in Atlanta? You can thank Jim for kind of helping get that initiative off the ground and successful. Uh, he was involved with it. Uh, the Georgia uh, Trust for Public Land, which acquired a lot of this private industrial uh, land and returned it to kind of public use. So, you know, helping with the built environment. So people in Atlanta getting out of their cars and actually walking and biking. It's an amazing thing. Um, and I can go on. Uh, Jim has, you know, long and impressive career in nonprofits, uh, but I want to turn it over to him so he can talk about this important project. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much. <clears throat> this is like uh, being back home for me, being in Athens, and I, 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 I'll only digress a little bit to say that my father was a real character. He was in Georgia legislature for many years, both in the Senate and the House, and, and, but his favorite thing to do was to come to Athens, and he graduated the law school here. He was a cheerleader here in 1942 when Georgia went to the Rose Bowl. And so, as a child, whenever we came to Athens, you know, back, I, lived, I grew up in Calhoun, way up in northwest Georgia, impossible to get to Athens. You know, it took you all day long to, to drive from Calhoun to, to Athens. And the entire way, of course, he was singing, you know, going back to Athens town or one other Georgia, something, you know. So I learned all the words to all the Georgia songs, all the cheers before I was 10 years old. So uh, yes, I had to come here as an undergraduate, uh, and I'm and I'm and I'm proud of that. And for those of you who are from out of state, and we had dinner with some of you last night, and had never been to Athens before, so it was fun showing off Athens and bragging about it, and how it has changed so dramatically in, in the past, you know, 30, 40 years since you know, since I was here as an undergrad, uh, and and so much for the better. But and Georgia has changed, and and that's a, an important part of what we're going to talk about. Today it's part of what we've been talking about with rural, rural health care, too. But I'm here to talk about a really serious, serious problem uh, that has been going on nationally that I know you know about, and that's the opioid and heroin crisis and, what it's, what it, what, and how it has affected Georgia and how it is continuing to affect Georgia. And the, the dim, I mean, really grim situation that we are facing uh, if we do not turn it around. Uh, and I was just this, this week at the National Rx Abuse and, and Heroin Summit in Atlanta. And let me tell you, it is dark, dark in terms of what's going on in these other states. And these are the key experts, medical and otherwise, in these other states. And every chart was just horrible. And, and, and I've been there the past two years watching the same charts, watching the same growth in overdose deaths. It's, and, and, they don't, and nobody has any answers. Nobody has a magic bullet answer in terms of how to turn it around. They are, they are turning their medical systems upside down in these states to address the overdoses, to address the medical and health issues. Nobody has figured out what to do on the prevention side at all. Um, and so I'm going to talk about that a little bit. But that is, that is a very grim situation, and we have got to think about that uh, right now uh, here in Georgia because we, we are the 11th worst state in terms of per capita overdose deaths, uh, and I can name all the other, other, all the other 10. Uh, and the others, are, number of them are smaller, and that's why their per capita is higher. But you've got some states where you've got 100 or 150 overdose deaths a week going on in those states. We have 25 a week in Georgia, 25 a week. That's more than automobile crashes now, deaths by automobile crashes in Georgia. But ours is growing. We're one of the states on the, on the rise, strongly on the rise. And we've got to figure out a way to turn that around. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, who we are, what we do, Georgia Prevention Project. Do I have a clicker? Okay. 
and forward. Okay, Georgia Prevention Project. Uh, we got started uh, in, uh, in Georgia. Where do I point it? Back there. Okay, that kind of works. We got started, we're a statewide prevention program aimed at reducing the use of dangerous substances, uh, particularly among teens and young adults. Awareness campaigns, educational programs, strategic partnerships. Those are the things that we do. We got started as the, that went backwards. Okay. I don't understand what's going on, but we'll try that. Okay. We got started as the Georgia Meth Project, the big anti-methamphetamine campaign. That got started in Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, some of those western states, part of the Siebel Foundation's work in those states in the 2006, 7, 8 period. Uh, we brought it to Georgia in 2009. Thurbert Baker asked us to do that. Uh, a guy named Lee Shaw, part of the Shaw Industries family, Northwest Georgia, uh, asked me to come and help him. I said, Lee, I can't do it. I'm, I'm working on two other nonprofits to have to do with something completely different. I can't, I can't do it. He said, give me 30 minutes to talk about it. Okay. 20 minutes into the 30 minutes, I went, I'm going to have to quit everything else I'm doing, and I'm going to have to work on this. I mean, the meth problem in Georgia was just that bad, in rural areas predominantly, but growing fast in metropolitan areas uh, too. Uh, very, very serious problem. We launched that campaign in 2010. We raised about six, or eight, six to eight million dollars of all private money. Uh, to make that happen, pulled it off, and we launched a mass media campaign. Uh, 26,000 radio spots, 23,000 TV spots, 588 billboards. We saw 80,000 students in classrooms, uh, and then we launched online ads, and 33 million Georgians saw those ads in just 18 months. Uh, and that's remarkable since our population is a third of that. So, you know, heavy, heavy, heavy media work uh, in those campaigns. I don't know if you probably saw our ads, very creative stuff. Uh, Hollywood producers and directors uh, created that material. Tom Siebel spent $30 million of his own money to create those materials. Uh, hired addiction professionals, uh, uh, sociologists, uh, psychologists. Did focus group, lots of focus groups with young people to be sure that we got it right with those materials. That's great, and we knocked meth down pretty hard in Georgia. It's still a problem, but we knocked down some things pretty hard. One of the things that we measured was perceptions of risk. Before we started, 35% of the teens in Georgia saw little or no risk in trying methamphetamine. 23% of them thought there was some benefit to trying meth. Help me lose weight, help me with boredom, help me study better. Cra crazy stuff, you know, that some 14-year-old heard from some 18-year-old probably. You know, just, just crazy. We launched this campaign. We've now got that down to less than 10%. 2014, the last time we measured it, it was at 11%. And we're doing some more measurement now. We think we've got it down under 10, you know, 8 or 9% or something like that. That's one of the key statistics. Now, we, we found lots of other data. I mean, there's lots of other stuff in there. But those are some of the key things that we were, we were measuring. Changed the risk perceptions for other substances. We didn't expect that. That's one of the things we figured out from measuring this is that not only did the perceptions change about methamphetamine, but people who saw any of our ads, saw anything that we had done, uh, whether it was in the classroom, online, whatever it was, their perceptions about risk changed for other substances too. That's great. We didn't, ex we didn't expect that. But that's a big part of what we were, we were hoping would happen. In 2014, I mean, we kept getting this message in 2012 and 2013 from school teachers, from uh, law enforcement professionals, from lots of other people. Hey, look, this prescription drug thing is coming on strong in Georgia. You, you got you to gotta expand what you're doing to that. And we were very tightly focused on methamphetamine and said, I don't know that, how we can do that. In 2014, we said, OK, we got to go. We got we to gotta move on. We've got to expand this mission. And with help from some of our big funders, uh, we made that determination. And reaching a broader target in terms of populations. Our first focus on methamphetamine was primarily 12 to 17-year-olds. Uh, well, now we have to focus on that same group plus young adults plus parents uh, because it's a very different uh, substance in terms of how, your, uh, how that substance gets to these young people. And monitoring the rise, continue to do that of other dangerous substances. As we all know, this stuff changes. You know, every 10 years, it seems to be 
there's some right, some new substance you got to worry about. Right now, this opioid thing has been coming on since the 1980s, 1990s, and now this is it, and it's a huge problem, a big expansion. We'll get into more detail about that in just a minute. We create and implemented additional programs, the meth project still under that umbrella, the RX abuse project and heroin education, substance abuse training course for educators, a college prevention program, and something called the Substance Abuse Research Alliance. The heroin education and this training course for educators, big part of what we do is go into classrooms, but we do that through teachers that we train. So we have a training class for these teachers, and these teachers can take, if they take the whole 10 hours, all online, if they take that course and do all 10 hours of that course, they earn a professional learning unit. And we've worked that out with a number of big school systems around the state where their HR departments now allow that. But if that teacher's got to teach something this week, next week, they don't have time to hold the, do, the, do the, the whole 10 hours, no problem. Take whatever course it is that they want to uh, put in that classroom and go with it and, and teach that class. We can monitor every single day which teachers got online, whether they tested it or whether they trained on it or whether they taught it to kids in the classroom, how many kids were in the classroom, which school it is, and we, we, we look at those results every single day. So we track that very carefully. Partly because that's what our funders want. Our funders want to know that. So we know at the end of every month, okay, how are we tracking on these things? And I'll, show you, I'll share some of those results with you uh, in a few minutes in terms of how we're doing. Expanded to a college prevention program. We're in eight colleges now. University of Georgia is one of those. Is one of those. Much harder on a college campus for a lot of different reasons to do lots of things. But we're in there, and we're training college students to be uh, peer counselors, uh, to do peer work in their individual communities. Now, we call a community everything from a dormitory to a fraternity house to, you know, you name it. But in those little communities, down to the micro level of making those things happen in those, in those communities. The Substance Abuse Research Alliance, I'm going to talk about that in a little more detail in a minute. That was an idea I had about two years ago when I went to some funders and I went, you know what? I'm worried that our organization isn't plugged in enough into the broader academic realm that's out there of all the research that's going on in substance abuse. Found out, guess what? All those researchers weren't plugged into each other either. And so we've created this Substance Abuse Research Alliance. Now, all the medical schools in Georgia, all the schools of public health, all the universities, any researcher in Georgia, uh, if they're doing anything in substance abuse, we want them part of our group, and, and a large number of them are, are in there now. CDC uh, as well, uh, Georgia Department of Public Health, Anybody and everybody who's involved in anything regarding substance abuse, uh, we want them part of this group. We meet about three or four times a year, and I'll tell you more about that in a, in a, in a minute in terms of what we've been able to achieve. The, the, again, these modules of, the, of what we do with this educator program, using these materials, we are, uh, these student lessons meet state and national standards. We're using award-winning materials from a variety of sources. We, we are part of this group. Remember, the meth project got started with Montana, Idaho, Colorado, Wyoming, some of those states. So they, we consider they're sort of our sister states in this work. So we exchange a lot of programs with them, do a lot with them. We're all under the same umbrella together. In fact, just in the past week, we signed a new agreement where we, in Georgia, now are responsible for all those other states. We've now brought them under an umbrella that we manage. Uh, here in Georgia to help them. License agreements with these things, sharing of these teaching materials, uh, trademark registration, copyrights, keeping up with all of that stuff. And then licensing, hopefully, to new states. We're bringing that on now. Even Australia wants to come to us now and license these materials for what's going on in Australia. They've got a terrible meth uh, amphetamine problem in Australia, and they've got a growing opioid problem uh, as well. This is what people do when they come into, if a teacher comes into the program, how they get in there and, and which courses it is that they use and how they click on those and move on through the training class. Just a couple of screenshots to show you uh, how they're able to do that. They choose uh, which ones of these programs or materials they want to use, uh, particularly as part of the training program. Great materials. I cannot tell you how good these materials are. And we could not have afforded to pay for all of those ourselves. I mean, some of these things, again, some of this is from Tom Siebel's paying, you know, $30 million of his own money to create some of these materials. He got Hollywood producers and directors, you know, Darren Aronofsky, uh, you know, some of these incredible uh, guys who created 
30 second spots. Now we did a lot of cheaper things too. One of the, one of the most inexpensive things that we found that was most effective were radio ads. Well, the radio ads were real simple, but highly effective. And those are where we took uh, kids, and this is in the meth uh, area, but we're doing it with some other things now too, where you found a kid who, had, who was in recovery, but just barely in recovery, in the first six months to eight months of recovery, still kind of fragile. Put them in a room with one person with a microphone and let them talk. Let them talk, 20 or 30 minutes. Out of that 20 or 30 minutes, we boiled that down to, to 30 seconds of some key things that they had to say. You might have heard some of these radio ads. Oh my gosh, they just, just tear your heart out. Uh, very raw. For kids who are listening to that, other kids, they got it. You know, they, they heard exactly what they needed to hear from somebody who was essentially of their, their, peer, their peer age group. We go into these classrooms, do these things. Sometimes we show up in new class. They don't want to hear, they don't want to see me. They want to see one of their peers, or they want to hear from these kinds of materials. They don't want to listen to a police officer. You know, and police officers mean well. Police, when they want to go and they want to do a program and get on stage and do an assembly, and the, and the principal says, yeah, maybe that's a great idea. Kids just turn off completely over that. You know, they don't, they don't like that. They don't want to hear from authority figures preaching to them about what they should and shouldn't be doing. They want to see real materials, real stories, and, and they're, they're, the thing we fear, they are, they are smart. They've seen everything. You can't, don't, don't try to fool them with scare stuff either. Give them straight talk, straight education. They'll take it and they'll say, yep, that makes sense. I believe that. I believe that's a dangerous substance. I think I should stay away from it. But that's what you got to do, and and we do uh, we try to try to feed feed into that. Again, how they come in and do these these things. Our school outreach program. This is as of yesterday. I mean, uh, two days ago. We so we we track it every day. We've trained 501 teachers just in 14 months. Uh, we representing 73 counties, uh, 20 large school district endorsements, and we've reached 40,991 kids in in 14 months. Now this number down here, this 40,991, will grow because what you've got is you've got these teachers, uh, as they continue to come on, those 501 teachers are going to teach 100 kids each per year once they get up and running. So those 501 teachers uh, are going to be training 50, are going to see 50,000 kids in a year. So that number continues to grow underneath that, underneath that curve. The college partnerships, I already mentioned in terms of what we're doing on the college campuses. Uh, and, you know, those things are, are fun and interesting, and the kids are always coming up with new, new ideas. The Substance Abuse Research Alliance, again, researchers and practitioners in substance abuse, uh, influencing and informing public policy, a big part of what, we, of what we're doing. And this is a, a, a representative list of people who are part of our group. We've got a couple of, of our members who are uh, in the audience today. One of the key things that we did this year <clears throat> as part of this group is that we published a white paper to help inform the committee uh, that was the state senate subcommittee on opioids and heroin. That was Renee Unterman's committee with Butch Miller, uh, those, those folks. They did a terrific job last fall. We created this white paper. It took us 10 months to, to get this together and, and make it happen. Uh, and where's Mason? I know Mason's in here, or he's out. There he is in the back of the room. We have got copies of the executive summary of this for you, uh, if you if you want to see it. Terrific stuff in here. It includes a legislative agenda for Georgia. Let me run through a couple of other things about it. A couple of key slides in here. Again, this is the overdose deaths uh, and what those mean and, and their relationship to car crash deaths. Uh, this growth in prescription overdose death trending higher, going higher and higher, just like it is in these other states. This is the worrisome piece down here on the bottom, this little red piece here, that's the heroin deaths. That's the heroin deaths. Because people, once they, they can't get the opioid pills anymore, they're too expensive, they run out of ways to get them, they go to heroin. The heroin's cheaper. It's $10 a shot. Uh, and that's just, a, that's just a fact in terms of what's, what's happening there. The, uh, the legislative agenda that we've come up with, several things there, increasing access to naloxone, that's happened. Uh, improving access to treatment and support, increased funding for prevention, increased funding and address neonatal uh, abstinence syndrome, and strengthening PDMP. That also happened uh, this year. The legislature just got signed, just got signed this week. 
So those are some of the key things that we uh, put on the agenda. We, we've got several other pieces of that agenda and, and invite you to, to look at what those are. A couple of those others. Increase oversight of pain uh, clinic standards and create standards for prescriber education. Create a recurring blue ribbon commission. This means every five to seven years, have a commission that says, where should we be going over the next five to seven years? How did we do over the previous five to seven years? How are we doing on our legislative agenda? We didn't accomplish all the things we wanted to accomplish. That's okay. Let's re-up the agenda and make everybody be part of that, out of that commission, from the governor's office, from the legislature, uh, from departments of public health, uh, people who are out there, nonprofits, you know, the communities at large, make them part of that commission going forward so that we can continue to do that and monitor what's, what's going on there. I'm gonna share one other thing with you. There's a book, and uh, I invite you to go and find a copy of this book. I have three or four copies with me. I've promised them to some of you here, so I don't have enough for everybody. This is a book called Dreamland by a guy named Sam Quinones. Sam uh, was a reporter, still is, Los Angeles Times. Uh, this is it. This is the book that will tell you all about the opioid crisis, how it got started, how it expanded, how the heroin came in right behind it, who's at fault, everybody's been at fault, in one way or another, uh, but this is the book you need to you need to see. It's called Dreamland by Sam Quinones. It will scare the daylights out of you, uh, but uh, but uh, you know, but it's reality based in terms of every every part of the puzzle. It reads fast, and I and I highly recommend it uh, to you. A couple of last thoughts. This thing in Georgia, I mean, this this opioid crisis. I'm telling you, it is horrifying what's going on, and these people from these other states don't have any answers, and they've been dealing with it in a lot worse way than, than Georgia has. We're talking about Ohio, Kentucky, West Virginia, New Hampshire, Vermont, Maine, Rhode Island, New Mexico, uh, Georgia. I mean, those are the states, uh, and Georgia is moving up fast. Uh, in Rhode Island, they, they laid out a thing this week where they showed these, this is the model for how they're having to deal with it. In these, in these treatment centers, in medical, they're having to, to orient their entire medical community and all their hospitals to treat this crisis. That's how many people are dying uh, in these hospitals. The scariest slide I saw showed the, the reversals of overdoses. Well, that's great. You know, people using naloxone uh, or Narcan. And so that number of reversals, you know, was going up like a rocket. Oh, well, 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 and you said, boy, that's, that's great. And they're reversing these overdoses. Well, guess what? The number of deaths was still going up right behind it. So, I, I mean, it's, it's just, you, we have no idea. I saw another statistic. If these trends continue in terms of the number of overdose deaths over the next, you know, five or six or seven years, in, the 20, in, the, in a 20-year period from about 2000 to 2020, the number of people who will have died from overdose deaths will exceed the number of all the people killed in all the wars that we've ever participated in in the United States. That's how bad it is. Now, you know, are we prepared for, for this upside down thing in Georgia like these other states are? No, we're not. We are not. We've been watching what's going on in these other states. You know, we're all kind of in a state of shock and we really don't know what to do with it. Well, guess what? Those other states don't either. You know, they're just trying to stop the deaths in the streets right now. So I've got some ideas about what we need to do, and I think, well, I think it, it may be that we need to create a new, uh, a, a, a new, I saw some good models from Colorado and some other states. Now they've come together in Colorado to create a model for how to approach that problem and what to do about it. We don't even have to have a model on the table in Georgia yet. You had a question? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Good question. Is that a, a 
I think that's a that, I think that's a potential model that people need to look at. You know, providers, particularly working with school nurses. Uh, you know, school nurses right now they need Narcan in the in the in the in the in the, in the class. I mean, you know, wherever it is at the schools, and they need these healthcare providers to help be part of that part of that solution. And if that includes parent nights where you got lots of parents showing up, we did one on Monday night this past Monday night. We had 400 people show up. Lasseter High School. Right. Yes. Yes. And, and let me tell you, there are multiple parts of this problem in terms of who's at fault. Okay. One of the biggest parts of the problem are parents. Our parents. Now, that's not true with methamphetamine, but it's true with opioids because the medicine's in the medicine cabinet right there in the house. And the parent, okay, we know about the doctors being at fault too. You know, I had neck surgery, I had throat surgery three years ago. They gave me 60 pills, you know, and almost a pint of liquid hydrocodone. I took four pills and had a tablespoon of the liquid stuff, all right? Any other, and, and you all know that that's true, you know, 50, 30, 60 pills is kind of, I asked Brenda Fitzgerald, you know, uh, you know, we all know who she is. I said, Brenda, why 60, why are they prescribing 60 pills? Brenda says, it's a round number, you know. It's two pills a day for 30 days, it's a round number. And they don't want the, you know, the, the patient to have to keep coming back to the, to the doctor's office and calling on the phone, so okay, just give them a big prescription, yeah. Good, good question. Uh, there's a researcher here at the University of Georgia who's quite good, uh, and he did some research on what's going on in Colorado. Um, and he says that the number of opioid prescriptions has gone down in Colorado substantially in the past couple of years. Now, the Colorado people were asked that question at this big conference in, in Atlanta, and they went, uh, we, we, we're, still, we're still evaluating the data. We're still evaluating the data. You know, they don't want to everybody's a little afraid to, 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 to say that, the, that marijuana is going to help make the opioid crisis go down. But for casual pain, I think people are using marijuana for casual pain instead of using opioids. Yeah, Amanda. That you saw it in, uh, say that again. Good. Amanda is a, Amanda Abraham is one of the professors here at the University of Georgia, involved in this in this research. Sure. Presentation, all the important work you have done.